It's your parole officer's favorite podcast, a.k.a. the Chad and Cheese <laughs> Podcast. I'm your co-host, Joel Cheeseman, joined as always, Chad Sowash. We are live Hello. at HR Tech from the Fuel 50 booth, and we Woo! are happy to welcome for his fourth appearance fourth. on our show, the fifth when he gets a velvet Going jacket. Going for the jacket. <laughs> he gets a jacket, so he's on his way. Keith Sonderling, EEOC Commissioner. Keith, welcome to the podcast. Thank you Again. for having me back. For Friend the, of the show. For the fourth time. Wow. I really appreciate it. And I also have to mention, of course, at HR Tech in yeah. a full suit and tie for the Chad and Cheese podcast. Yeah, you you're don't stick your, out at all. Your, your cool <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, T-shirts. So it was, it was funny because he was coming down the escalator yesterday when we were meeting him. Uh -huh. You know, just to kind of like you know say hey, we're going to kind of a Trumpian. And he was coming, coming down. down he was coming down the escalator. With he didn't the have the tie pizza on, in the background. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it was and it was funny because Julie was like. I can't believe he's wearing a suit. I'm like, of course he's wearing a yeah. suit. Got to play the part. So, Keith, it's your fourth show. Some people don't know you. Yeah. Just give us a quick Twitter bio about you and what you do. Sure. I'm Keith Sonderling, Commissioner at the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Whew. That's a mouthful. EEOC, as you all in there HR know it, yeah. the there charge of discrimination coming across your desk. And that's us before uh, joining the EEOC. I was the acting and deputy administrator at the Wage and Hour Division. Also, something like very familiar to HR professionals. Yes. And before that, yes. I was an employment lawyer in Florida defending HR professionals there you go. in uh, cases against these same government agencies. So I've seen uh, both sides both of the sides. equations. And, uh, and a Florida yeah. grad, we're, we don't have confirmation on the Tim Tebow tramp stamp. Yeah. <laughs> but we will eventually... <laughs> Eventually, get him to a pool the, where we find what's out what's going on. the name of the mascot? What did that gator? Gators. Is there, the Albert. Oh. Albert and Alberta. Oh yeah. Do you have, so wow, do you have Albert edgy. like on the uh, be, between the, the the shoulder blades? That's or? a question I don't have to answer. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so let's jump into it, dude. You are everywhere. Yes. You're at Salesforce. Yeah. You're at, you're at uh, LinkedIn. You're here at HR Tech. That's something that most past commissioners don't do. What's your goal? What are you finding? What are you hoping to learn and get out of all this traveling? Well, uh, it's really important for me to get out and leave D.C. because you know the action is happening around the country, and if I stay in the Washington D.C. bubble, I'm not going to be able to you know learn what HR professionals, what tech buyers, what tech developers, what tech yeah. funders, with the practical applications of these really advanced HR software and workplace technology tools, which, as you know, I believe is the future is yeah. where all this is going. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to be able to give the guidance and regulate in this area if I don't understand the community, if I don't understand what the concerns are, if I don't even understand what the products are that are being offered. Yeah. You know, so many times in D.C. it's just hypothetical. Well, I believe tech vendors are making these kind of products that yeah. are going to potentially discriminate and do this. And then you, you come to these shows and the reality of it is that technology doesn't even exist. And they yeah. don't even, you know, they yeah. can't even make programs that do what they're being accused of doing in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So that's why it's so important for me to get out, to talk to people, to walk around these booths, to really work with the vendors and help them in a sense, too, of saying, Saying that here's what you're here's the problem in HR you're trying to solve. All of these problems, as you both know, have significant legal implications. Yeah. And how can I help give those tools and guidance based upon long-standing laws, nothing new here, yeah. to actually have them be able to develop the technology, to sell the technology, and then more importantly, the people buying the technologies, the companies, the HR departments, what they the questions they need answered as well when they're buy all these products and suddenly it's in their portfolio. Yeah. And then also most importantly, we can't forget the users of these products, right? Yeah. Who are them? Who are the consumers here? It's the employees. It's applicants. Yeah. And you know, that's who we protect at the EEOC well, as the well. Impact, the right? impact of yeah. that. So you can see how it really it's the entire ecosystem. And it's so important for me to learn all the different um, perspectives that come with that, or we won't be able to do our jobs in DC. So, so there's a lot. Are of you doing fear. a secret shopper kind of thing? Because you you stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I probably should. Hi, have worn I'm a full HR suit. Joe. Yeah. Here to ask you about would you, your would you, would you uh, like unbiased. A, would you like solution. a Chad Cheese T-shirt? <laughs> yeah, maybe I need to go a little more undercover. <laughs> so but no. there's a lot of fear around AI, right? And we're seeing it. We're seeing it in uh, in DC. We're seeing it throughout. Practitioners are afraid. I mean, it's one of those things where. You know, you are now digging into it. Should they be that afraid of AI and large language models? You know, it's not the, the fear that concerns me or okay. they shouldn't be afraid. They should just say, well, okay, what 
how are we using this? Yes. What purpose are we using it for? And how is it going to impact my workers? And that's the questions that they should be thinking about when they're buying, when they're figuring out to develop this. And those are longstanding questions that HR professionals and talent acquisition has been asking for any kind of recruitment tool. Yeah. Well, before so AI, it's no different. Before computers, before yeah. you, any of this was on the internet, when you're just doing employment assessments on pencil and paper, right? Yeah. There were considerations there. Is this actually going to tell me... Um, going to make a productive workforce yeah. or is this going to be a tool that discriminates and that you know outside of technology has existed for a long time we need to just go back to that thinking when it comes to these technologies here's what i know in hr here's the impacts of mm. whatever program i'm doing and now because of the scale of generative ai the scale of yes. technology it's just much higher stakes that's that's the key right so when we moved from paper and pencil uh, paper and pen applications to the internet we saw huge scale, right? Huge in scale. So we were able to get more qualified and more candidates into our systems. But we didn't but we couldn't manage that very well, which is where the black hole came from. And there are also uh, regulations and things, you know, that in internet applicant rule, yep. a lot of a lot of things happened because of that. But that scale was like step one. This is like the next step of scale, right? So we've seen this before, and this is what I'm hearing from you. We've seen this before, don't be afraid. We have to be able to understand, which where you guys come in to educate, and then and then enforce yeah. if 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 the education's not taking and then arrest <laughs> and arrest. Well, he has handcuffs in his back pocket. I don't think I don't think I've so seen anybody yourself, in in a in a orange jumpsuit uh, due to the EEOC. Oh, yeah, we? you just yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Please let us know when they're. I'll, I'll give you a warning, but you know, in all seriousness, <laughs> relating to issues like regenerative AI now yeah. and all the buzz at these conferences is how generative AI is going to make your workers more effective. How you'll be able to eliminate positions by incorporating generative AI. And in your podcast, you talk about all the time about all the newspaper articles saying X amount of employees are going to be laid off or you know, a company saying, well, we're going to completely not hire for this position anymore because we could use generative AI, what we're seeing with some of the striking workers yeah. in Hollywood related to fears of generative AI. Yeah. But let's just break that down, what it's actually doing to where HR professionals and talent acquisition understand. So if you're saying, if you're in TA now, and your boss is saying, okay, we're, we're no longer going to hire for this position because we're gonna use generative AI. Uh -huh. Or you're on the other side of the house, we're saying now we need to lay off these workers because the computers can do it faster. Yeah. Who is that gonna impact, right? So if you're laying off certain groups, what are the breakdowns on protected characteristics such as race, sex, ethnicity, and how is it gonna impact those groups? So before you're saying, well, let's just wipe out this entire team, yeah. you think about how much money companies spent on diversity, equity, inclusion, oh, yeah. getting in young, new, diverse, talented workers from applicant pools that they've never seen before. Yeah. So you spent millions and millions of dollars and all the software to get in a diverse workforce. Now you have a decision to say, okay, we have generative AI, we can now replace this workers. Who is getting impacted from these reduction in workforce? We've seen it before. Forget technology. First in, first out. Yep. Older workers who are making a lot more than some of the younger workers because they've been there longer. And that's the same implications that's gonna happen when you're talking about using generative AI. So if you don't do it carefully, right, a theme we've talked about before, how you just, just the amount of care and time and effort it needs to take when integrating these softwares, what are you gonna have? You're gonna lay off a whole group, which is now gonna be your most diverse group that you've just done through your um, recruiting. Uh -huh. And the impacts of that are gonna be discriminatory. Or you're saying, well, the older workers, you know, they may be impacted because they don't understand the technology as much. We don't want to spend more resources to go out and train them. That can be age discrimination. And that is not much different than we've seen in reduction in workforces in the past, you know, how certain groups get broken down. So I think there just needs to be a lot extra care when you're talking about the generative AI, replacing workers, or even making workers more efficient, yeah. right? Think about that. Now, chat GPT is going to make your job 80% more efficient. Well, you need to learn how to do it. Yeah. And that may be difficult for disabled workers if they don't have the accommodations necessary. So again, it's a lot of those basic HR principles that we can't lose sight of just because yeah. it's new technology. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, switch flip flip the script the the script real quick one of the reasons why disabled workers are having a moment right now is because they were able to work remote right now we have all these companies who are moving everybody back into the offices right and that is not something that many of these individuals can actually do one of the so therefore from your standpoint are are you actually you and the team actually looking at how 
this move back to the office is bad from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint and negatively impacting individuals with disabilities who are doing the job at record levels. And these are people hired remotely, yes. thought their job would yes. always be remote. Exactly. And now the switcheroo, it's not. And you've seen a lot of articles on that. And yeah. let me just take a step back. You know, at the EEOC, the federal government, we can't get involved in business decisions of whether or not your employees should work remotely or they should work in the office, uh -huh. right? Um, the employers still have that, you know, outside of a collective bargaining agreement or a contract, you know, which could be breach of contract claims in what you're talking about saying, well, my contract says I get to work from home, now I come uh -huh. to the office. Different story, right? Our perspective is whatever decision you make, whether you allow certain groups to work remotely, whether everyone has to come back in the office, that's up to you. But for those who can't come back to the office yes. because of a disability, you have to engage in that process. And what we're seeing now is so much pressure to get everyone back to well, the office. Isn't that an accommodation and, and something that is normal for a company to talk about? Is it a, a, a normal accommodation for an individual who, who needs to yeah. be able to work from home? Right, but we never saw it before the pandemic because those they weren't working those accommodations <laughs> you you know people weren't working remotely yeah. people were coming in the office and if you said i don't want to come in the office you know 5 days a week because i have fear about riding the subway system because let's just say you know there's significant crime in my city now and that gives me anxiety or i'm worried about getting the next strand of the virus yeah what would a, what would you say okay come to work or you're fired Get on the subway and get to work, right? Well, We've never really seen those before, but now this is really coming in to where employers can't just put those aside because they're really coming in under mental health claims under the Americans with Disability Act, which you're alluding to in that sense where before there was never a federally protected right to telework, yeah. remote work. Mm -hmm. Now what we're seeing is that the claims are coming in because employers are saying, I can't come back to the office because I'm depressed related to coming back to my old world, that I'm so much more, you know, productive at home, I have a new life at home. That's one thing. But now they're saying that my mental health is not allowing me to return to that world. And I've gone and sought treatment. And I'm coming to you, HR, and saying, I am disabled under the Americans with Disability Act. Uh -huh. And if HR departments, and this is my key message when it comes to this whole conversation, if you're not empowered to go through that interactive process, and if you are under pressure by your bosses to get everyone back in the office, and you're set, and you are ignoring those claims uh -huh. um, because you either think they're ridiculous, they don't think they're right. That's not for you to determine. You have to engage in that process to see if that you know here's the condition the employee is coming. What are the accommodations related to this condition? Working with their mental health provider or yeah. their MD, whatever it is, and saying, well, maybe a remote work schedule is what that accommodation is. Maybe it's coming in at different hours. Maybe it's uh, alternative commuting methods. Maybe it's having noise canceling headsets or having dim lights. There's, the answer may not be remote work, right. but just engaging in that process with their healthcare professionals is what HR departments need to focus on. To your point, they know how to do that, but they have to be empowered to do that even though there's such a push to return to the office yeah. because it is going to impact disabled workers um, more than others. And it, we're really seeing the mental health claims rise significantly. And what do we mean by mental health at the EEOC? Um, the top claims are anxiety, PTSD, and depression. And we're seeing those claims really increase year after year. And that's where, you know, disability discrimination has been there for a long time. But we're seeing the types of claims coming in. And a lot of that is simply just not engaging in that process yeah. to see what those accommodations where can be. Where is napping on the list? Because I'm waiting for that to be a disability <laughs> that my employer recognizes. Because I don't recognize napping. <laughs> I, I, uh, you, been, you, you guys have been in the news a lot with indictments and in cases that are being brought. What's the reason for that? Is there a trend on the kind of cases that you're seeing these days as opposed to years past? You know, well, we have had an uptick in um, litigation, and there was an uptick in charges of discrimination. And for our fiscal year 2022 increase, which went up 20% from the year before, a lot of those were related to the post-COVID vaccination claims, right? Oh. So everyone was always asking, 
you know, tell us how COVID has impacted the workforce. Well, we had additional 10,000 religious discrimination charges related to employers, employees who did not want to get the vaccine and fighting over that. So we saw that blip related to there. So okay. that's one reason for the increase there. But as far as litigation is concerned, you're, you are seeing an uptick in those cases. And a lot of those, again, it's related to what those trends are. Uh -huh. And we're seeing a lot of claims related to um, disability discrimination um, increase uh, in addition to the number one cause of discrimination in the United States year after year is, want to take a guess? Oh, maybe I can. I'm Got taking over the podcast nah, 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 here. Nah, nah. That's not how it works. Yeah, a, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in this. This okay. is your job. Wow. My, my gender affirming uh, something or other. I, I, was, I was waiting for you to, to say something. But the number one claim of discrimination across the board, in all seriousness, is retaliation. And we're ah, seeing that yes, because yes. it's tacked onto other claims. So you come in and say, you know, I wasn't paid because the same as my coworker who's yeah. of additional national origin. And the employer says, yes, you were, and now you're getting paid less. Or yes, you were, and now you're fired, right? So we really see those claims in addition to the underlying claims where you request an accommodation or you claim you're not paid equally or you put, claim you're discriminated against and then something happens to your employment. So we're seeing a combination of a lot of those in the litigations. Yeah. So you have the underlying claim of discrimination and you have the retaliation and that just tacks on more um, causes of action for employers. And you, you just had your first AI specific case. Talk about that and, and how it ended. So this was a case um, that we brought uh, out of New York and it was a company that was using uh, their their hiring website, and, the, and this is sort of the, the broader debate which you'll hear about what is AI, what is machine learning, yes. is this really AI or not? Yes. And most people would say, including me, that this was not AI, yeah. but uh, listen to the facts here. So there was a, a, a company that offered, it was a Chinese company in New York that offered English tutoring service in the United States. Okay. And uh, their application system, which was just their website, somebody went and applied, and they put in their birth date, immediately rejected. Uh. Same person went back. Hello. And changed their birth date by a few years to be a few years younger okay. and was immediately accepted. Uh. Now, none of us are machine learning PhD MIT <laughs> scientists, no. right? But I think the three of us collectively Can with deduce. our small computer brains could, crack that could probably <laughs> make that code pretty easily, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Could crack this, that code. This is my yeah. A-team yeah. here. <laughs> Bring in the best investigators, Chad and Cheese, on the case. But you see here, I mean, that's just basic coding, right? That's not sophisticated algorithms yeah. in the sense. So there, um, they... They blame the AI. They, they blame the computers. <laughs> they blame the system. They also said that, you know, in other countries, they're allowed to do it's this. It's not us. This doesn't fly yeah. in that sense where that's just straight age discrimination. But it goes to a broader point, which we've talked about on earlier podcasts, about how quickly on the applicant side that these cases can scale, yes. right? So yes. think about every person who is qualified for that job that would have applied for that job and would have been rejected because of their age or didn't see that advertisement because of their age could be in a potential class of age discrimination against that employer. And that's why it's so critical in the talent acquisition space where you know having your, your systems ensuring that they're not automatically screening out people based on age, people based on gender, you know, what yeah. these tools can allow you to do, yeah. or where you're actually doing your advertisement placements. And there's a lot of technology out there that's going to help with diversity recruiting, getting job ads in different places. Well, if there is, a, whether it's a line of code or the algorithms designed not to show the advertisement, which of course is federally protected to certain groups based on race, age, sex, you know, we really see this more in the age context, like wow. new college grads, just let's just go there. Everyone who is qualified for the job can be a part of that class of saying that they were discriminated against right. and the employer would be liable for not potentially hiring them. Yeah. You know, it's a complicated analysis to get there, but you see the value of these cases, how large they can get quickly. Yeah. And then another part too, what we did in one case, um, is that we used um, AI, we made the, the employer use uh, AI to go through in a, in a job board to go through their system to make sure that there wasn't any discriminatory terms too close to each other that would preclude people to high, uh, to apply or not to apply. Yeah. So you can see yeah. there's also good uses of this too, which we've talked about on the front end advertisement side. So we're, but you know, we haven't seen the large scale cases yet. And why is that? It's because a lot of employees still don't know they're being subject to the algorithms. Yeah. They don't know whether it's an interview, whether they're um, natural language processes is looking at what they're saying. Right. That consent requirement, which uh -huh. we don't have yet, 
Um, until we see that, I, I think it's going to be very hard to for these cases to come to us. Because don't forget, when you come to the EEOC, you're just claiming discrimination based on protected category. So you're coming in saying, I was discriminated because uh, my age. There's not a box that says technology discrimination, right? Just like earlier on, there wasn't COVID discrimination. Right. So we have to then do the investigation to see, well, was this COVID related? Yeah. Was this technology related? And that uh -huh. takes time and resources. So until you see changes in the law and consent or employers start doing consent, you'll start correlating some of these cases that will come in. Keith, thanks for popping in. We know you're a busy guy visiting a lot of companies oh, and people. Be on the lookout. For those listeners that want to connect with you, maybe have some questions, where would you send them? Uh, always just find me on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to uh, connect on there. Soon to be sporting a Chad and Cheese smoking jacket on his <laughs> LinkedIn profile. Chad, it's always fun to sit down with Keith. We out. <laughs>